I came here for my undergrad of getting my master's at Central right now, and I'm focusing a lot on queer theory through my coursework, um, which is great. There's a lot of cool classes that get offered for Canadian studies in English here, too, so I'm going to be on the lookout. Um, right now, I work for the Connecticut Community Foundation. We're a 501c3 that supports all of our province, um, sort of in the western side of Connecticut. And Tim invited me to come speak, and so I figured we'd come talk about um, literature in the 20th century and sort of how it developed an identity narrative. Um, I put a bunch of little handouts on the tables. If you didn't get one, it's for supplemented reading things that are on the PowerPoint screen um, to look through. Fair warning, there's some things we're going to talk about. Um, so I'd like if anyone is able to volunteer to read some things out, because I'd hate to stand up here and just read a passage. Um, but we're looking at literature, so we're going to look at the words. Uh, we're going to focus on styles, themes, images, um, and also sort of the development of the identity through. Um, but first, I'd like to start uh, with sort of a thought exercise. Um, and you're welcome to share this, but how would you define the word gay if you can only use six words? And how would you define the word homosexual if you can only use six words? Uh, it's sort of a, a way to figure out what points of identity are really critical to understanding what we mean when we say gay or homosexual. Uh, and I like to think of a quotation from To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, Atticus told me to delete the adjectives and I'd have the facts. Sort of throughout the 20th century, bits and pieces get added on at different points to create an image of the homosexual. Um, and we're going to look at passages that sort of combat against that or sometimes work with it. Um, but would anyone like to take a, a stab at how you would define gay with only six words? I can't tell if everyone's looking there because they're thinking or looking there to avoid making eye contact. Maybe both. <laughs> Maybe both. Both is fine. Yeah. Um, attracted to the same sex. Well, that's under. Can it be under six or has to be six? Could be under six. So attracted to the same sex. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anyone else want to take a stab at gay? Four, for example. Or homosexual? Medical definition for diverse sexual behavior. Okay. I try to make it six. Just. Uh, so sometimes I also teach um, at sort of older adult uh, continuing education areas. Um, and whenever I do this, the experiment usually ends up with gay being these things about how people are feeling and sort of what they're doing. Homosexual becomes very clinical. Usually definitions end up using medical terminology or they just feel sort of sterile. So we have this idea of a gay person versus a homosexual. And that's going to come up um, sort of as we move through. Uh, but I wanted to give two pieces of background information before we got into the 20th century, particularly what allowed for a development of female sexuality. As some of you who might have taken women's studies courses know, female sexual identity was not really considered to be existent for a long time. They thought women could not really enjoy sex. They were just sort of there. Um, and what happens is that you have access to the economy and you have access to education. Um, and these first about 12 slides are, are detailed in the handout in case we gloss over something you're interested in. Um, but essentially, we saw greater economic access. Uh, middle and upper class women were allowed to start taking actual jobs, um, which allowed them financial security away from husbands. Uh, they also saw what, and we're going to talk a little bit about Dracula today, um, what they were calling the new woman, this sort of new identity for females who were financially independent, who didn't rely on the family or marriage system in order to secure a living, and who often lived in cities or with other women. Um, and this also let women sort of access movements, social movements and social areas that they weren't previously allowed to be in, particularly feminist, abolitionist, and temperance movements. Um, you have also the highlight of women's education in the 1800s. 
um, starting with in the U.S. Uh, Mount Holyoke, Vassar Smith, Wellesley, Bryn Mawr. Um, what's really interesting are the statistics that correspond to female education, particularly that 10% of American women remained unmarried between 1880 and 1900, and of that 10%, 50% of them uh, were college graduates. 57% of the Smith class of 1884 never married, and of the women who received PhDs from U.S. universities in 1877 to 1924, 75% of them never married. Um, so this combination of statistics played an image for sort of the American public that well-educated women don't get married. Um, statistics, you can read them in a number of different ways. I think it tends to be that they had greater access and could live on their own. Um, and particularly, but also if it's been lesbians and they want to marry men. Um, and we'll come across some, actually a passage about that, um, from Frances Willard, who was the American temperance leader. She wrote a book called Glimpses of 50 Years in 1889, and she said, the loves of women for each other grow more numerous each day, and I have pondered much why these things were. That so little should be said about them surprises me, for they are everywhere. In these days, when capable and careful women can honorably own their own support, there is no village that has not its example of two hearts in council, both of which are feminine. So this sort of idea that women were living together financially independent and in love with one another had become so prominent that Frances Willard, who could have potentially been a lesbian, decided that she was going to write about it in a respectable manner. And we'll see the different types of writing that comes up. Um, but you also have in the 1800s the creation of the homosexual, uh, by which I mean a uh, term. So you had uh, K.M. Kirkpenny, Carl Maria Kirkpenny, who was a Hungarian-Austrian writer and journalist. He's the first guy who we can find published records of ever using the term homosexual. Um, so in terms of how we follow history and how we follow the development of words, this is where the argument comes in where people say, well, you can't call Shakespeare gay. Or you can't call him a homosexual because the word didn't exist. And there's a lot of identity politics and associating people with words that are several hundred years after them. Um, but he wrote it in response to a Prussian legal code that criminalized sodomy between two men. Um, particularly, I won't read both of these. They're in the handout, though. Uh, in, his, in his anonymous pamphlet, he mentioned um, sort of the contradictions in criminalizing sodomy between men. Uh, however, to punish the relationships of the very small minority of homosexual natures as true and hardened brutal criminals. He found it bizarre that people who were have, men who were having sex with men were now sort of out of the graces of government. In terms of where the law allowed, this meant that people could no longer vote, they didn't have rights to land, um, the same as if they had murdered or any other atrocious crimes. He also thought it was odd in the second side there. Uh, because of this act is dictated to be especially degenerate and degrading only between one man and one woman, not also between a man and a woman or two women. So at this point, you still have that lack of female sexual identity to quite catch on that women could be doing these things and enjoying these things. Um, but he noticed that they were odd, and he's the guy who published publicly the word homosexual. Um, so that's some background on what happens in the 1800s before we get into the 1900s. Does anyone have any questions on that, or something that is bizarre or sort of struck out? Um, so at the, at the start of the 1900s, a little bit right before, you get the sort of construction of homophobia. Particularly, homosexual people are now pinpointed with physical and emotional characteristics, particularly that the men were feminine, the women were masculine. They were physically weak, morbid, morose, melancholy by nature, abnormally sexed, physically deficient, perverted, and inclined toward violence and insanity. Um, and this gets sort of perpetuated by a doctor who was in the U.S. in 1889 uh, named Dr. G. Frank Linston. Uh, he said one, he has one of the earliest examples of a homosexual agenda uh, in 1889. He says, there is in every community of any size a colony of male sexual perverts. They are usually known to each other and are likely to congregate together. At times, they operate in accordance with some definite and concerted plan in quest of subjects wherewith to gratify their abnormal sexual impulses. He gave this as a sort of a medical address. Uh, with the creation of the term homosexual, it was adopted into medical canon, as I'm sure many of you have come across um, in studying it. 
that this was considered not default. And so not default and not, in a religious setting, it was relegated to medical discourse. Um, and this myth that, that gay men and women work to achieve some kind of nefarious goal percolates in America right up into the McCarthyism of the 1950s. Uh, so, but let's get into the literature. Uh, we'll start with, with Bram Stoker. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have read Dracula. Has anyone read Dracula before? No one else has read Dracula? It's really good um, and very gay. Uh, so, Stoker wrote Dracula in 1897, so he's right on the cusp. Um, but since everyone knows what Dracula is, it clearly has a sort of a part in the American uh, public presence. Um, but Stoker talks a lot about the new woman. For those of you who have never read Dracula, um, you have Lisa, or Lucy Warren and Mina Harker, who are the two main female characters. Um, one of them, they're both two different types of new women. Um, but the main cast of the characters work to sort of stop Count Dracula, and Lucy and Mina uh, provide assistance. Mina is married to a male, the John Harker, who's the main character. And so her identity is fixed in relation to men. She's very obedient. She's secretarial. So she sort of has that training that women were acquiring at the time. Uh, but she's obedient, so she never presses too far out of her bounds. Lucy, on the other hand, is the woman who Dracula turns into a vampire. Um, the new woman represented this blurring of gender roles and demanded sort of a new space in society. What, how do we react to, to women who are no longer subservient? And so Bram Stoker sort of writes the characters out. And we're going to look at two passages. Um, so page three of your handout. Uh, we want to look at one of the sections with the Bride of Dracula, which are really fascinating. And I'm going to stop talking. And who would like to maybe read a paragraph of it? Or a couple of sentences? Yes. The Bride of Dracula. He is young and strong. There are pieces for us all. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me until I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying sweet, a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. That's almost you got. I was, afraid, I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over, simply gloating. There was a deliberate, voluptuous, which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arced her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white, sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. Then she paused and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and I could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin on my throat began to tingle as one flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches near, nearer. I could feel the soft shivering touch of the lips on the super sensitive skin on my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. So this is, this is the scene where very early on in the novel, um, John explores Dracula's cave, or his mansion. And he comes across this room that's bolted off, and for some reason on this night of the full moon, it's opened a little bit and he sneaks in. And he meets uh, the three <coughs> brides of Dracula. And so this passage is, is very specific, right? The imagery is very obvious. It's clearly very sexual. Um, which is funny because people don't tend to think of Dracula as a novel being something that's very sexual. It's supposed to be creepy and scary, but it's very much more psychological, right? In terms of physicality, not much is happening in the scene, right? John is sort of lying there and she's moving around and over him. But it's the heightened sensual awareness that makes it something that's more scary. Um, so you get this, this feeling that the sexuality of the scene is what's really going on that's scary to John, not that he's about to be ripped open by a vampire, but that he's enjoying it. There's all this ecstasy imagery. Um, does anything about the passage sort of stick out otherwise? Did anyone, is this surprising to have read from 
something that we think of as being written so long ago. Um, this is sort of like the, uh, like the analogy of the mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The bride is definitely the person in control. Um, and you can also see the brides as some type of new woman, not necessarily one that has economic independence because they do rely on Dracula to live, um, but one who definitely has a sexual autonomy. Uh, anything else in the scene? Sticks out? scene from Dracula that's a little bit longer, so we'll, we'll have some um, other participation. It's particularly on the next page of the handout, it's when they kill Lucy. Um, and so to set the scene, this is the second half of the novel, uh, which has a very distinct tone than the first half. Uh, I've read some speculation that the first half of Dracula was written before the trial of Oscar Wilde, and the second half written after. Um, so Bram Stoker became more nervous of what he was saying and decided to code it. So when Lucy becomes this very sexual, independent woman in the first half, the second half, she sort of meets a, her demise. Uh, but they chase her into this coffin, in this cave. It's exactly what you'd expect to be from Dracula um, until you sort of sit down and read it. Um, we've got a couple of paragraphs here. Who would like to take the first one? Yeah. Take the stake in your left hand where you can place the point of the heart of the left hand where you right. And when you can not prayer from the dead, I shall read I have here the book, and the other shall follow. Strike in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead, that we love, that the undead. You want to take the second prayer? Um, the thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous, blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth champed together till the lips were cut, and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never, fal- but Arthur never faltered. <clears throat> he looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up, up around it. His face was set and highly duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage so that our voices seemed to ring through the little ball. Do you want to finish it off? Okay. I was going to read just the next paragraph. Okay, I'll, finish. I'll finish it. It's okay. I was getting lazy. Um, so, <clears throat> and then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed to champ, and the face to quiver. Finally it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had not been forced to to his task by more more than human considerations he could never have gone through with it. For a few few minutes, we were so so taken with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled, startled surprise ran from one to the other of us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground and came and looked too. And then a glad, strange light broke over his face and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon him. Oh, I guess there's a the last paragraph. I'll do this one, uh, unless someone else would like to volunteer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please. Coffin lay no longer the foul thing that he had so dreaded and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to one of the best entitled to her. But Lucy, as we had seen her in her life, with her face of unfold sweetness and purity, true that there were there, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste, 
but these were all dear to us, for they marked for truth to what we knew. One and all we felt that the holy calm and lay like sunshine over the waste of face and form with only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was So this is considered one of the, the major stopping points of the second half of the novel. Uh, they start chasing Lucy sort of throughout England. They get on a lot of trains. That's uh, sort of a detective novel for a little portion of it. Um, but this is the point where Arthur, who is her husband, comes in direct contact with Lucy, who was his wife, or to be his wife, and she's this vampirus hiding in a, a coffin. Um, before I sort of dive into anything into it, what sticks out about it in a different sense of the other section? Um, and these are some questions if no one has made. Um, but what sort of jumps out really blatantly, or not so blatantly? Sort of starts off as this thing, um, they kill her, and then she returns back to Lucy, and she's pure, and everyone is sort of okay with it all of a sudden. Anything else? There's definitely, uh, so this is when English majors sort of sit around and talk at whatever cafes they're at. They always end up talking about phallic symbols. This is one of those phallic symbols. Um, and it's, it's very literal, right? Lucy returns to this pure state after she is being sort of staked in the heart. Um, it is def definitely, there are way too many words to describe it in this passage. They're all over the place. Um, but it's also not like you would imagine sort of an undead person to be. Right, there's all this blood, there's this gushing, everything is red. Um, it is a very sensual scene. Um, and in a sense, also, I guess, a very sexual scene. Um, you could read into it from the creation of Lucy being back to this normal person that it's the influence of her husband, even in a sexual manner, that contains the new woman. Um, this is still around the time when people thought that um, there was wandering womb syndrome in the woman that if she was too hyper or too sad, it's because her womb was floating around in her body, and so if she had a baby, it would center it in her, her stomach, and that would cure her. Um, this is, the traces remain probably until like the 1970s, honestly, but um, it's, it's the influence of the husband that cures her. Uh, but let's, let's also talk about the brides, which is kind of interesting. There's three of them, and there's one of them. And they're also, as we mentioned earlier, they're sort of more autonomous than you would expect a bride to be. Um, does anyone, anyone have a comment on that? On its uniqueness? What's kind of fascinating is that in a couple of uh, scenes after that, um, Dracula pops into the room while they're sort of over John. And he gets very defensive over him. He says, no, he's mine. And so you get this idea that between the brides and Dracula is not a happy marriage, right? Because in a sense, everyone is sexually autonomous from the other. None of them really rely on each other. And so it's a calling into question of sort of the marriage structure that was really perpetuated in the early uh, 1900s in the Victorian era, where there's this unit of family that keeps everything stable. The brides of Dracula sort of turn that on its head, saying that the only thing they really need for Dracula is for him to go out and get food. Otherwise, they don't really care much about him. Um, which was a pretty scary thing for men to read in the 1800s. Um, what about John's role in the scene with the brides? What do you think, what do you make of John? And you can, one way to look at scenes in literature when we're not looking at a whole book is to just look at the words, right? Obviously authors are very telling people, their, their word choices are very specific, um, but what what do we find in the language of the scene that tells us about how John is interacting with the brides? Um, 
combination of both, he's feeling a sense of fear, a sense of arousal. Um, then I don't have a hand up. And he is also, as someone mentioned earlier, sort of the passive recipient in this scene. Um, this is not John the vampire slayer. This is John the person who found himself in a complimentary scene for him and is sort of hanging out to see what happens um, until he gets taken out physically removed from the scene. Um, so we talked a little bit about the, the underlying imagery of killing Lucy by her husband. Um, you notice that it was Lucy who becomes pure again after the scene. Um, is there any connection you see between the scene of the bride and the scene of Lucy dying? The murder of, of the vampire Lucy. So it is sort of, it's a, the connection between the two is a sort of a law and order scene where the, with the women are on their own, they're dangerous and they're, they're predatory, but when they're under the influence of their husbands, they become more, more docile and more pure. Um, no. <laughs> what, I think what else is interesting on the connection between the two is you get to also see the overarching framework of female sexuality, right? In, in both scenarios, they start off as sort of animalistic, um, which is really telling of how people were viewing the female role, or the role of, of women in sex in the, in the Victorian era. Um, but again, right because it's on the cusp, this pushes well into America, this stays in our consciousness even now, like every couple of years is a new Dracula movie. Um, but none of them, again, take the spin of what Stoker was implying when he talked about the relations between the characters. Um, you just sort of get the mystery and the, the suspense of it, but not the sexual undertones or overtones, mostly overtones. Um, any questions on that before we move on to a couple other texts? Yeah. I was just wondering, when you mentioned the Oscar Wilde thing, can you like explain that connection a little bit more? Because, you know, haven't some queer, like literary scholars, um, you know, describe Dracula as maybe a, a metaphor for like queer identity and these sort of things. So how does that sort of, I guess, fit into this maybe imagery of female sexuality? Sure. So uh, throughout Dracula, um, so John goes to his, his mansion in Transylvania, and what he notices first off is that there's no one else in the mansion. Uh, the reason why this is important is because throughout his time there, People are cooking food for him, people are entering his doors, people are folding his clothes, people are making his bed, but he can't find any maids. Uh, what you get in a couple of scenes is, it's almost it's actually almost kind of comedic because Dracula, you're reading as he's quickly putting together this dinner table while John's turning a corner. As John turns a corner, he's standing by the table like holding a chair for him. He doesn't want John to see that he's making the food. Um, obviously, for us in 2017, these are very trite images. Um, in terms of Bram Stoker writing them, they're sort of new and exciting, right? He's, he's really creating female stereotypes um, very strongly in early America. Um, and one particular scene and where people comment on Dracula sort of in existing within a queer space is that there's a scene where John is shaving in the bathroom. Bathrooms are very private spaces. Right? Um, bathrooms always have locks on them. There's only one person in there at the time. And John is shaving in a mirror, and he sort of, he nicks himself on his chin, and suddenly Dracula is there. And the scene is very close. Dracula is right behind him. He's breathing on him. He's looking at the blood. It gives a sense that, that Dracula himself has a sexual attraction to John in general, but in specific to the blood, um, which is where we get this imagery. That he's really the only one who ever goes around sort of feasting on, on other people. Um, except the brides who eat a couple of babies early on in the novel, which is a, exactly as weird as it sounds. Um, but so Dracula exhibits um, and exists within sort of a male-dominated space and a female-dominated space, and he's one of the only characters who willingly sort of passes between the two of them. Um, so, yeah. And, and in terms of Bram Stoker's relation to Wilde, um, there's, there, I think there's decent enough understanding or speculation that Stoker was probably less than heterosexual, and his relation to Wilde is what caused him to sort of stop writing 
and potentially change the tone of the second half of the novel. Uh, you can almost sort of cut it down the center and see at what time periods it was writing. Uh, any other thoughts or comments on Dracula? Does anyone want to go read it right now? Yeah. Do you want to read it right now or do you have a question? Yeah. It's pretty, it's fun. Um, and, and you get to sort of see how we, as a society, uh, generate a narrative around a piece of literature that may or may not correctly coincide with literature at all. Um, but let's talk about, now, we're into the, the 1900s, and we're going to look at um, some decidedly more queer spaces. That was a really good transition, and I promise I didn't tell Tim to say that. But, um, but we're going to look at sort of a new landscape for American literature um, in the 1900s. Early on, uh, we saw sort of a literary change to the way people were writing about gay characters. Uh, for example, they began to want very directly address um, non-heterosexual desires. Two sort of prominent novels in the early half of the 1900s uh, are Charles Warren Stoddard's 1905 novel, uh, For the Pleasure of His Company. It's sort of set in San Francisco, and the main character uh, decides to sail off to the South Sea in search of happiness. Going to the South Sea was sort of one of those literary symbols for someone who was finding himself sexually liberated. Um, could no longer be sort of in mainland, didn't want to, wanted to go, and you can also see stereotypes of people who are on the sea in the 80s. Um, this is sort of percolating at the time. Henry Fuller in 1919 wrote um, Bertrand Cope's Year. That's actually set um, in America throughout it, and the main conflict is that the main character um, somehow eludes a marriage trap and then runs off with his, his boyfriend, his male partner, for the novel at the end of it. Um, both are pretty happy, particularly because it's sort of a game changer for American literature at the time that they're no longer looking backwards at their history. Um, the Victorian era saw a heightened renewal of looking at Greek and Roman allusions and references to sort of understand sexuality. Um, Early America says, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to start looking around rather than backwards. Uh, fiction is placed in Chicago, New York, Boston, London, Paris, and Berlin. Um, and characters were no longer sort of these historical identities. Um, they become sort of this amalgamation of everyone around them. This is when you can start seeing um, and reading really more, much more exciting literature that we would find now. Um, and we're going to look at two of them. And just to, not to mention that a lot of character identities became drag queens, cross-dressers, um, and prostitutes of sort of all sexual, sexualities and varieties. Um, any questions on that? It's, it's a pretty early American tradition, and it's a little specific, I think, to American lit. Um, uh, so one of the first people we have to talk about is a person whose name is, I think, in a moderate amount of dispute. Um, there's Earl Lind, who we know was a person who was involved with some books. The books he was involved with were printed under someone named Ralph, and they were about someone named Jenny um, that we sort of understand as an autobiographical narrative. Um, Jenny June, as I think the author would have preferred to be called, given by the text that they wrote, um, was sort of the sexual persona, um, what the author referred to as an and androgen, uh, or sort of this person who wanted to live as another gender. This is a little bit before transgender, as we know it, was around in the American language, or the American discourse. Um, at 1903, the author, um, at the age of 28, had herself castrated, um, sort of out of this guilt sense, and we're gonna we're, we'll see guilt underlined. Um, but I came across this author in a collection of work called The Columbia Anthology for Gay Literature. Um, and I would like to just read sort of what the editor thought about Pearl. Um, and he says, with a very modern pride and a very eloquent voice, he argues for, indeed demands, that society recognize not only the sexual, but the social and political rights of those fairies and androgens who even then may have been called gay people. Though stricken with guilt over what he called his cravings, he nevertheless decides that he must follow nature's behest and live according to the dictates of my 
peculiar instincts. This revelation leads him to become a sexual suffragette, marching for the rights of people, of those people whom he clearly sees as his people. Um, this is pretty early on and, and pretty significant for a number of reasons. Um, and this was from the novel itself, actually. The picture in the center is what the author took um, to include as the photo. I don't think it actually made it all the way to the publication, but um, it was around. Who, so before we sort of talk about what this might mean, who wants to read a quick paragraph from the second book written by the author um, in 1922 called The Female Impersonators? Yeah. My own is uh, a Herculean task, an intellectual icon quest, to break down the last remnant of cultured and savage criminal instincts and laws. In the 20th, 20th century, leaders of thought have evolved from belief in witchcraft. They must look elsewhere than to send semi bearded hags for their sacrificial victims on whom to load the sin of mankind. And the blame for the decline of all nations. Since next to hags, they consider sexual cripples as the most loathsome of humans that make the latter the scapegoat of present day society. So, what sort of, what are your initial reactions to reading? I'm assuming if no one has read it, might not have come across this particular text before either. Um, what, what stands out as interesting? So what else is happening in 1922, sort of broadly, or what had just sort of finished around the 1920s? Jim Crow? Hmm? Jim Crow clause in the Federation? Um, then we'll move into it, uh, but more, or, yeah. You had the rise of, of suffragettes. You also had right toward the end of World War I. Which became and it was sort of seen as a, a hyper masculine time period. Um, at the same time, this is being written. Keep in mind that people like Eliot and Pound, T. S. Eliot and Ezra Pound, are also writing and starting to form another literary movement. Um, and the modernist era sort of starts. Um, what do you make of of the the theme, I guess, of the passage? Does it is it startling that this was written so long ago? and yet its language seems to be fairly transferable? Do you think it's not transferable? Um, and these are sort of questions that are open to debate. There's not really a necessary, necessarily right answer or wrong answer. Um, but we're sort of looking at it at the eye of a critic. We're not a critic, that's scary scariest term. Yeah? I think it's like transferable, because like obviously across like history, like we always want to like blame the like deviant or we always want to like go back to the old norms and the way things were like thinking that we go back to the way things were things will go back to normal and like everything will just like subside and like all our problems will be solved rather than like facing them mm -hmm. and like accepting that there are like other people trying to live other different kinds of lives sure yeah absolutely um, any other thoughts on message or theme of the prayer yeah well, if you parallel it to like modern day time, like if this passage is trying to say like we evolved past thinking that like, everyone was a witch, um, it's kind of the same with how now we have evolved uh, in America to like have marriage equality for same gender couples, um, and it's like now they're just going to the next marginalized group with like a lot of laws targeting 
Right. There seems to be something particularly American about finding the next person in line where you can sort of foist all of the country's problems on. Um, this connects pretty strongly to the idea of the, the homosexual agenda we looked at earlier, that there's a group of people who work together nefariously um, that work to undermine American society. Um, and I, I pick this passage versus other passages in the other texts um, because this is where you can see more clearly the mission of the author, right? It's not to just write about a narrative of what happened in New York City, which there are certainly several chapters of sort of the sexual underground of New York City, but it's about finding the, the passion the author had in sort of an advocacy standpoint. Um, any thoughts on it? Can we check out another? Um, the other book to definitely we have to definitely talk about is Robert Scully, Robert Scully's book The Scarlet Pansy, which is written in 1933. This is a very interesting text. Um, sort of unlike Jenny June's work, The Scarlet Pansy doesn't position the main the main character, who's named Faye Petrange, which is um, French for a sort of strange fairy or strange shadow, um, in between being a sexual deviant or someone who's trapped in the wrong body. Faye is a very unique character, especially for sort of early American literature and, and queer literature in general. Um, Faye moves away from gender boundaries. There's no interplay with them. Uh, she is sort of this uber new woman. Uh, she's very independent. She's financially secure. She's in control of herself. She has no need for pretty much anyone at all. Um, major plot points to sort of give you an idea of why this was an important text um, happened in the, the second half of the novel particularly. Um, there are a bunch of scenes where Faye is sort of proving her strength. Um, she shovels coal, she plows fields, does it entirely autonomously. It's never even perceived as, wow, this is amazing, look what she can do. This is no, Faye is doing this. Um, she uses her immense financial and intellectual genius to just become one of the wealthiest people the novel ever even encounters. Um, she travels all over the United States um, and, and parts of, of the rest of the world, and she does it with an advocacy standpoint. She's always talking about the importance of people's identities. Um, and the, sort of toward the end of the novel, she goes to Paris on the night of World War I, um, and she sort of meets this all-American football player, um, very handsome army guy, and immediately falls in love with him. Um, he gets moved to fight on the front lines and Faye is sort of left in Paris. But what's interesting is that Faye's character uh, is a patriot, loves the United States and loves fighting for the United States, and sort of goes incognito to fight on the front lines. Um, and then sort of in this very dramatic passage takes a bullet for her lover and sort of dies in honor of, of God and country, um, which is definitely not a narrative that emerges often. Um, the Scarlet Pansy is, is unique in its perspective of the main character. She just is this all-around kind of phenomenal person who plays into the idea of American politics rather than tries to move away from them, which is more, I think, groundbreaking in terms of, of stereotype interplay. Um, but I want to, on, on page five, there's a passage that I love out of the, of the Scarlet Pansies um, that I think it's important to look at. Who would like to sort of take us away. Yeah. 
to be one of the one of the funniest characters before like 1940. Um, and this particular scene shows the immense control over social protocol Faye has. Um, she and to go up to a policeman who uh, is typically seen in literature as someone that you definitely would not approach as as uh, probably at all. Um, but you've got her walking up, creating this elaborate ruse, asking what kind of cigar he smokes, doing an entirely fake errand just to bring back a cigar. And then after a week, that's it. They're, they're out together in public. Um, the reference to the language of flowers is, again, that sort of codified speak. The policeman's never going to ask outrightly. She's never going to answer outrightly. But they're both going to understand what's going on. Um, combining this passage with with what we looked at for Faye's character, um, what do you what do you make of this character? Is this an interesting character to you? Would you read *The Scarlet Pansy*? Um, this is 1933. Also, not the best time in America. Um, Faye becomes this immensely not anti-American, because she's very patriotic, but something you wouldn't see around you at all. A person in total control of, of, over their surroundings. Um, but what, let's unpack it if we could. What do you guys think of it? I really like this passage, I think it's hilarious. who's on the book, there's a lot of authorial dispute. It's not entirely sure who that person is. It could very easily be a pseudonym. Um, it could just be another persona. What's interesting is that, particularly with, with early American queer literature, because of the nature of things being written, the identity of the author is always sort of kept on the margins. It's never quite sure who's writing what, um, as we saw with, with Jenny June and, and three different aliases. What else sort of strikes you about about the passage? Um, I think the the unique part, um, the, or the most telling part about Faye's character, is the line where she says, uh, "They were now old friends." Right. That is. I, I don't know of many characters in literature written in such a way, outside of probably things Oscar Wilde wrote, where they just coerce the person into just liking them, right? And to know that Faye goes on to become this patriot dying for, for her country, uh, in no way is Faye a weak character. This is, and this is at total, the totally other end of Jenny June's work, where a lot of it is sort of morose. It does fit that character description we talked about for the homosexual. Um, where they're melancholy, they're sad, they're inclined towards insanity. Um, although Jenny has this upright nature where uh, she's going to work toward an equality standpoint, Faye just never starts from that area at all. She emerges to the scene as a well-rounded character in control. Um, there are two other really important texts to talk about. Uh, they're British texts, but they heavily influence American literature as well. Um, the first one is by Radcliffe Hall, who is a British author, and she's one of like the first celebrity lesbians. Um, everyone knew Radcliffe Hall was a lesbian. Radcliffe Hall never hit it. Radcliffe Hall lived with women for her whole life, um, and she was well known for being a lesbian and, and existed as as the lesbian um, in Europe. Um, she was born in 1880. Um, died in 43, she was very strongly influenced by European sexologists. This was a field of study 
um, not entirely unlike things we'll talk about today, or in today's times, but about the relation of humans to sexuality. Um, she actually had Pavlov Ellis, who was, this, who was probably the world's most renowned uh, sexologist, write the foreword to her book, The Well of Loneliness. This was to give it sort of a credibility. If Havon Ellis said, yes, this is a good book worth reading, then the sexual nature of the text could be taken more seriously. She was very clever. Um, like I said, she lived very openly as a lesbian um, and s spent much, much of her life sort of in some kind of passionate, very public love affair. Um, and she wrote The Well of Loneliness in 28. Um, and when it was published um, in France, it sort of had a subtitle called like The Lesbian Bible. Um, this was considered like the definitive work les all lesbians had to read in order to know what being a lesbian was like. Um, it's called The Well of Loneliness, so you can kind of get what they thought being a lesbian was like. Um, but she was clever in that um, it only gets kind of sad toward the end, and she was sort of pigeonholed into making a sad ending. She couldn't have a novel uh, widely published in which the lesbian main character had a happy ending. Um, but she did it deliberately. So you can sort of give her some credence. Yeah. Wasn't like extremely easy to get such a person. Yeah. So, um, so she, her, the novel was quickly brought under obscenity trials. Um, it was banned in pretty much everywhere except France. Um, I, just in line with what I think people think of France at the time. Um, and but with Europe had stopped the death penalty for same-sex um, crimes. And so she could have been imprisoned for like hard labor. Again, because of the way people were perceiving females and female sexuality, um, they weren't, it wasn't likely that she would go into hard labor like Oscar Wilde did. He did several years of hard labor before dying. Um, she gets put under obscenity trials um, and just kind of powers through them. She becomes famous because the book hit the market and was just quickly taken off. And everyone, actually, there are many accounts of people traveling to France to buy a copy of the novel and bring it back. Um, it wasn't even allowed to be mailed into the US. Like they would, if all the books were being opened at the time, and if they saw the well known news, the post office would trash it. Because um, it just was not allowed in the US at all. Um, but on page six of the handout, there's a very short passage um, that I trimmed down. So you're welcome. It was very long in the beginning. I was like, we'll just get to the um, but it's a, a very important passage in the whole text. Uh, who would like to read the Rule of Yeah. Then suddenly Stephen knew that unless she could indeed drop dead at the feet of this woman in whose room she had put him, there was one thing that she dared not let pass and challenge, and that was this terrible slur upon her love. And all that was in her rose up to rebuke it protect her love from such unbearable or soiling. It was part of herself, and unless she could save it, she could not save herself anymore. She must stand or fall by the courage of that love's proclaimous rights to tolerate. So in The Well of Loneliness, um, the novel is making a joke on um, sort of very early British works where they're talking about the person's whole life. The novel literally opens with uh, Stephen's parents, um, and her mother is pregnant. And they think, actually, that they're going to have a boy. They're very prepared to have a boy. They bought boy things. Um, and they've already decided to name the baby Stephen. And when the baby is born, it's not a boy. And so the mother actually has a very poignant passage where she says, what do I do with this son? And so she decides that she's been calling this baby Stephen for so long that to call the child anything else would feel wrong to her, so she decides to continue with the name Stephen, um, which in more recent times has sort of allowed us to read the whole novel as more of a transgender narrative rather than a lesbian narrative. Um, in this scene, uh, Stephen is in a relationship with a woman and comes back to her family estate to tell her mother. Her mother finds out that she wrote a letter about her lover. Um, and it's a, it's a very dark scene. The mother reacts uh, very negatively. And the imagery itself is sort of physical. The mother talks about being repulsed or being sickened. Um, and, and Stephen says to her, you know, as my father loved you, I love another woman. And her mother just shuts her down and 
says, that is not the same thing. Those are two different types of love. And then this scene happens when Stephen sort of has this realization that her job is to defend her love um, because she does sort of have these protective, um, not necessarily patriotic, but, but very defensive roles around the people in her life. Um, and, and decides to rebuke her mother. But uh, these are three very specific images. Um, the first one is a newspaper caricature of, of, of Radcliffe Hall went by John, um, privately and publicly for much of her life. Um, this was in the newspaper when the obscenity trial was happening. The second picture is um, John with her longtime lover and partner, Una Vincenzo, um, who was Lady Trubridge, who was married to a knight, um, and sort of divorced the knight, kind of didn't really divorce her husband, um, but they lived together um, for a very long time. This was her, sort of her main, her main lover. Um, and the third one is from a book. Um, the caption reads, John at Forecastle. Uh, she was an avid newspaper reader, especially during the years of World War II. Um, the reason why I want to, I'd like to combine these images with the section from The Well of Loneliness is because you can almost see it sort of semi-autobiographical. Uh, Stephen Gordon is described as very slim, very tall, very masculine, broad-shouldered, narrow-hipped. Um, she, uh, Red Paul played in a lot of the stereotypes of lesbians at the time um, and used them all to describe Stephen Gordon very actively. Looking sort of at pictures of Brad Paul, you get the sense that she put herself into the novel, particularly um, with the middle picture, was sort of her iconic style of dress. It was a tuxedo jacket or a dinner jacket, one down bow tie but a skirt. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen pictures of Brad Paul wearing pants. Um, of very mostly skirts, uh, but top up was always sort of the masculine dress. Um, I also just really like the picture because I, I think Una, Una Trubridge's hair looks like Magneto's helmet. Um, it's very, it's just a really cool hem. Um, and the third one is sort of the everyday picture that was a candid photo of, of John and just a jacket reading the paper, sort of every day. Um, but I'd like to pause and sort of gauge reaction to these images, or even particularly, um, for those of you who can see more of the imagery in the first picture, what you guys make of how how the public is reacting to Radcliffe Hall, um, or what the public might react with, or what strikes you from the caricature. Yeah. Um. This might, this is like, you know that movie? I can't think of it. Uh, where she like kisses the frog? It was like just came out. I can't think of it. Nah. Princess and the frog. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. And like there's this like, uh, uh, like magician guy, and I like kind yeah, of. That's like, it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. Where do you see the magician guy? Um, like the character of her. So, like the, <laughs> like the main figure of the hat looks like the magician? Yeah, just like the like slim body and like everything. Right? Yeah, that's interesting because you get that witchy imagery back to what we had read a moment ago where yeah. that non, non-traditional non sexed or sexual person is a sort of occupying this third space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very, yes, there's definitely a cross behind her. Um, and she is sort of as if on a cru- or as if being a crucifix. Um, you, you also have um, really, for those of you who can notice from where you're sitting, really defined legs. Like they're very muscular. Um, this gives the impression that Radcliffe Paul is, 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 is not feminine. Right. It's not whether or not she was actually physically strong, but the point is that look at her. Look at her legs. They're so strong. This is not a lady, um, church and sort of British society lady, more of a status symbol. Um, she has this very bizarre little demon thing, uh, which is kind of like a like an evil Cupid, right? Commenting on on the love, the nature of love in the novel is not the traditional love or the acceptable love. 
Uh, I don't know who the little butler guy is at all. Uh, he kind of looks like the Grinch. Okay. Uh, and then you actually have Buddha True Bridge down there in the corner. And you can tell because her hair is so distinctive. Yeah. It, so last week's lecture was about Oscar Wilde and the importance of being earnest. So we saw, um, for folks that attended the lecture last week, a caricature of Wilde during the obscenity trials. And I think this is still very reminiscent of, of those, too, in the fact that you know, the author at the center of this caricature almost looks to be like sort of flaunting mm -hmm. their gender identity and their sexuality and um, sort of you know is very public with that. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a, sort of a few parallels between those caricatures, too. I think, um, I'm not sure if there are any other major uh, obscenity trials about sexual literature between Wilde and Radcliffe Hall. Mm -hmm. um, she might be the next one. I'm not, don't quote me on it, but I don't think there are any other really prominent ones. Uh, of course, things are put in obscenity trials for all sorts of different reasons. Um, but in terms of expressly and explicitly, um, explicitly sexual characters, I think this is the next one in line. Um, has, any, no, has anyone read The Well of Loneliness? Noticing a trend, guys. You should read the literature, it's exciting. Um, which is never a case I can make successfully. But, uh, what, any other things strike you about the images um, or the passage? Yeah. I think it's in the passage really interesting that she feels so adamantly about the, the sacredness of the relationship protected. Um, and then it ends on that word toleration, which is such like a different word, right? Like she can't expect her mother to respect her love or to understand her love. She only expects her to tolerate it, which I feel like is language that we still like are dealing with right now. Like, oh, do we really want tolerance? Tolerance suggests that they like, put up with you right. Right. rather than I accept you. So I just think that that, that mm -hmm. word is like such a letdown at the end of that passage. Yes. Right, especially because in terms of the, le the level of the language, it builds up so powerfully, right? She must stand or fall by the courage of that love to proclaim its right to toleration, right? It's this entire let up and then it just drops right down, um, which uh, carries on with a lot of the themes, right? That this, this is not, there is not an open world for women at the time. Um, Stephen Gordon, of course, as I mentioned, goes back to her family estate. She comes from a very wealthy family. Um, so she does have a lot of, of sort of class privilege that is that uh, is never directly discussed, um, particularly because uh, Radcliffe Hall wanted to show a sexuality that is not deviant, right? And in terms of British society, the way to do it was to have the, the person be sort of noble. Um, but so this, like I said, this happens in in Europe, but um, influences America pretty heavily. The novel is well known and well read, despite being. And the last, the last text we're going to look at um, is, is unique as well. Uh, again, it's British, but it's influenced America heavily. It's Ian Forster's uh, Maurice, or Morris. Um, so this is Foster, Forster's only openly gay novel. Um, you might know him from like A Passage to India or Room One's Own. Um, but what's unique is that this book was written in 1913. Um, but he didn't want the book published until after his mother had passed away. Uh, he was nervous that she would be upset or couldn't handle the scandal. Um, so he, he never published it. And that, even after she had passed away, he held off. And it wasn't published until one year after his death in 1971 by another major British gay author, Christopher Isherwood. Uh, he oversaw its publication to make sure that it remained relatively untampered with. What makes it unique is that this becomes uh, the first major gay novel after Stonewall. Uh, it doesn't get banned because it's not particularly obscene, um, but it hits Europe and America at, the, at roughly the same time. The publishing industry obviously is much larger at this point. Um, but it, it has a space in, in American society post Stonewall. Um, this was a picture I found from like a theater production. Um, which I'll explain why I selected it. But the last passage, would anyone like to 
start off. Uh, the parts in brackets, I just figured I would let you know who's speaking uh, at the beginning. But uh, who would like to start us off? Yeah. Maurice confronts Clive. As I said before, I'm not here to get advice, nor to talk about <coughs> thoughts and ideas either. I am flesh and blood. If you'll condescend to such low things, said Maurice Hall. Yes, quite right. I'm such a theorist. I know, said Cliff Durham. And I'll mention Alec, Maurice's lover, Cliff's gamekeeper, by his name. It recalled to both of them a situation of a year back, but if it was Clive who winced at the example now, if Alec is Scooter, he is in point of Zach no longer in my service or even in England. He sailed from Buenos Aires this very day. Go on, though. I am reconciled to reopening the subject if I can be of the least help. Anyone want to finish it up? Yeah. 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 scope of this particular novel, um, Maurice is, uh, he went to Cambridge with Clive. This is a, from this production um, early on. In the first half of Maurice, you see that he and Clive are very intimate. Um, it's steeped in a lot of reference, so it's not necessarily, until it becomes very explicit, it's not explicit. Um, they talk a lot about Greek architecture, Greek statues, um, music. They use a lot of coded language, sort of like in this called pansy, the language of flowers. They were talking about something without really talking about it. Um, and it becomes kind of obvious that Clive and Maurice are in a partnership. Um, it, it, whether or not the public views it as, or the public in the novel views it as something sexual, they are to each other in a partnership. Um, they sort of move on, they grow up, and then uh, Maurice falls in love with Clive's uh, gameskeeper, his groundskeeper, um, who is Alec. And this is, in sort of the same way that Radcliffe Hall was talking about a society standard, this is the similar thing. This is very high society, a Cambridge, a Cambridge scholar dating a groundskeeper. Um, and for, for Forster, this is the, the major contention of his life the difference between class. Um, and so the novel particularly highlights the, the struggle in moving between realms. Um, but what sort of, does anything jump out about that? It's very short. Um, the confrontation takes place in this museum. So this again goes back to Clive's uh, sort of tendency to look at, at history and art. Um, but does anything jump out or is unique? What do you make of this coming out versus Radcliffe Hall's coming out? Right? She demands his right to toleration. He just sort of mentions out that, you know, I was with your gameskeeper and I gave him everything I had, which includes my body. Um, what can we make of the difference sort of between uh, early lesbian narrative, early gay narrative? Um, Does it seem more or less climactic than Radcliffe Hall's? Less climactic? Yeah, there's definitely a difference between, between sexuality as sort of a verb and sexuality as a noun. Yeah, Radcliffe Hall and Stephen Gordon is definitely saying, this is who I am, this is central to who I am. Boris is like, well, this is this thing I did that I like doing and I'm not going to stop doing. Um, what about this allusion to sort of pillars of society? Does that seem from 
Um, I guess my question specifically is, is that translatable to American life, do you think? This idea of these pillars of society, we can't show violence. Um, also, a pillar of society couldn't have uh, a sexuality that's not heterosexual. Does that seem non-transferable or transferable to American life? But how do you think this plays into um, a society that just experienced Stonewall? You know, this is the first major novel published right afterwards. Um, definitely identifiable. Christopher Isherwood was not someone who was uh, largely in the closet. Um, so they knew if Isherwood is working on it, that it would definitely have a, an undertone to it. Do you think people in the U.S. were picking this up and agreeing with it or disagreeing with it? It is interesting, I mean, it was written in 1913, um, which is not necessarily a, a reason to not have reacted with violence, as we saw in a bunch of different ways. Um, and, and to a degree, Forster would have had to have known that violence could have been a possibility, which is why he sort of held off it being published for so long. Um, but any, any final thoughts on that? I was, there's a software on the internet that you can make images with, and I made this image the other day. Um, so I didn't talk at anything about James Baldwin, which if I didn't mention him at all, I would be reprimanded by anyone who ever talked about anything. Um, and so I just want to close with a passage out of uh, one of Baldwin's earliest works, um, one of Baldwin's most uh, homoerotic works, uh, Giovanni's Room. In this scene, it's in a, a nightclub in Paris. It's about a, a person who expatriates out of the country. And it just reads, somebody said, Jock, your father or mine should have told us that not many people have ever died of love, but multitudes have perished and are perishing every hour, and in the oddest places for the lack of it. Um, the significance, I think, of this passage and sort of why I put it after um, a section about Forster is because this character saying this is probably one of the grimiest characters I've ever read. Um, but he has this really eloquent scene, one very eloquent scene, um, where he almost seems like he's a human person. Um, the rest of the novel, he's this incredibly predatory, um, very nasty old gay man. Um, but I think there's something to be said of for, if we're talking about queer literature in, in the US or in the 20th century, there's something to be said for how we choose to read novels. Uh, I think there's certainly a lot of discourse and dialogue around um, people saying, well, this is clearly a gay text, and sort of the academy saying, no, this is impossible, it can't be a gay text. But I think we as a readership have the ability to select scenes or to choose to read novels in whatever specific way we want. Um, that's certainly its own venue of criticism, uh, which is, the, I think the encapsulated theory of, of what I tried to put together was sections we can read in different ways um, by authors who are writing in different ways. Um, but that is all I had prepared, and I, there's some time for questions, or not, if anyone has any questions. Overall, in general, uh, other hey things you think I should read, things you think um, we shouldn't read.
terms of has anyone read gay literature? Any favorite books? Yeah. Um, well, I guess so. When you said gay literature, so I read John Knowles, and I, I think a lot of people probably have read this one. John Knowles is a separate piece from like 1959. They usually assign it in like high schools because it's like a coming of age story and these sort of things. So usually like the 13 to like 15 year old age demographic gets assigned this book. Um, and you know when you mention about you know reading a text, so this is like one of these controversies of like, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but people who aren't. Um, where the author was like, these aren't, this isn't a gay story. Like these aren't, and this is like a criticism of this book was that, oh, well, these are homosexual characters like published in 1959 and very controversial for that regard. Um, and so the author like comes out in an interview and is like, this, you're reading it all wrong. You're like, no, no, no. Um, but for me, like, you know, before coming being out, you know, and reading that, for me, like I was like, oh, this is so cool that like our, you know, uh, literature teacher assigned this book because it, it read with very explicitly queer themes to it. Um, so I don't know, I, I just like your comment that you made about, you know, being able to read a queer text, or being able to read a text through like a queer lens of analysis, mm -hmm. even if the text isn't, and the author didn't intend for it to be queer. Right, yeah. what's interesting is, if, um, are there any English majors in the room? No English majors. <laughs> what a time. Um, one of, the, one of the first rules that we get told is authorial intent doesn't matter, um, which is interesting because so often we come to those defenses where, well, the author didn't mean it, and for anyone who studies literature, we're already told it doesn't matter what the author means, it matters what the author happens or how the reader reacts with it, um, which sort of gets us into a lot of murky discourses. But um, yeah, you have the option to read a text in any way you want. Um, but what about any other, any other favorite LGBTQ texts anyone's read? This is also me trying to get a reading list. Does anyone read? <laughs> what guys? Yeah. I can't remember the title we're talking about. Um, but What's I, it like? <laughs> yeah, I can remember the story. Um, it was about uh, in Bohemia in America and about a young girl who grows up and she's very um, independent, which is unusual. Um, and about how she doesn't want to get married to young and things like that. Um, all I remember, <coughs> I can't pull a chapter. I was the author's name. There you go. Um, I remember reading the first chapter of the book, and I had like read the synopsis of the book, and it was for English class in high school. And I was is it Maya Antonia? Yes, Maya Antonia. And I was reading the description of how she describes, uh, I think, Antonia, the girl. And I'm like, you know, this is. This, this sounds like a really gay description, even though all of the couples are straight. Mm -hmm. And then I looked up Willa Cather, and she was probably a lesbian. She um, was a giant lesbian. Yeah, and Absolutely. I was like, wow, I was really surprised to see how much it came through in the book. Yeah. Because I like read it, and I was like, I even though she's in a straight relationship, and she wrote the relationship for really well, I was like, I don't think she was straight. Yeah. Um, Willa Cather actually went to college for a whole year under the name William before anyone noticed that uh, that wasn't <coughs> or that she also wasn't a man, um, or at least didn't necessarily identify as a man all the time. Um, but yeah, Willa, Willa Cather, Mantinea is a really interesting. It's one of those ones that gets sort of slid into a high school curriculum that remains sort of unexamined. Um, thanks guys, thanks. I think, any other final thoughts before we conclude? <laughs> yeah? I was just wondering, do we think it's important that like we can't like pick out like queer texts that we've maybe read for classes? Like is that maybe like symptomatic of like a broader issue of like curriculum that we're engaging or encountering? So it's just kind of a question for the room. Yeah. I was just thinking about that how it's like frustrating that like it's like great that the history and English curriculum has been like working to incorporate like a lot of minority authors and like historic figures, but like we never ever learn about like queer figures or queer authors mm. or anything like that. Just to like, that changes the next so. Yeah, I mean I remember when I was taking my undergraduate courses here, um, I mean it's definitely skewed toward English <laughs> studies. So there was more of a margin. Um, but you sort of had to select the courses, I guess, to get the books. 
but I think I mean I think there's also a trend now to move toward or move a little bit away from literature and toward movies and TV shows, um, which is, as far as I'm concerned, another viable way to to understand society. Like it's not it's not higher or lower than literature. Um, it's just a different venue. I think we react more visually. Um, but can you get a motion to adjourn? Thank you.